welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm glad that at least some people found the way into my talk. Um, my name is Martin Sigel. I am from the German Aerospace Center here in Cologne, um, from the um, group for Institute um, Simulation Software Technology. And uh, today I'm going to talk about how to bring a compute intensive C++ based applications to the Android platform. Um, just a brief outline here about my talk. Uh, first, I'm going to try to motivate why this might be important, why you have to program native code for Android, since for Android standard um, programming languages, Java, as you might know. Um, and uh, as an introduction, I want to motivate that um, with the app Tegel, which we are developing at the German Aerospace Center, which we were porting to the Android platform, and so this is why we did that actually here. Then I'd like to talk about the hacking aspect, so what steps you're going to go through um, when you want to bring your code to Android, so um, how to prepare your, um, your environment for native app development, and I'm going to talk about how you compile all your third-party um, dependencies like libraries and everything you're, go uh, you're going to use. And I'm going to talk about how to use the Java native interface um, to communicate um, between the Java code and the C++ or the C code between both worlds. Um, third, I'm going to talk about um, the building itself, so how to integrate the so-called uh, native development kit from Google into the new Gradle build system. And finally, I'm going to talk about um, running everything and testing everything under an emulator, how to do it efficiently, so not using a standard emulator, and how you can also use that uh, in order to debug your code uh, from Eclipse and with the NDK GDB program. So first of all, uh, why do you want to do that? So it's uh, probably not the standard way of programming Android apps, but you might have uh, some already large code base and desktop application, for example, and you want to bring that, your, your program, to the Android platform. And you have already some large code base which might be tested already, and rewriting everything to Java might not be reasonable to, to numerous reasons. For example, you might introduce any errors into your code, and you don't want to do that, of course. Um, also, your code might depend on other third-party libraries. And which you don't want to rewrite in Java. and There might be no counterpart in Java. So it's basically just too time consuming and too expensive to do that. Also, um, another aspect are that uh, numerical algorithms are already implemented or mostly implemented in C or Fortran because uh, the C and Fortran compiler are really highly optimized, producing very fast code. And so this is the reason why you would use that from C and, or Fortran. And also, if you want to write a game, for example, you have to have really performant graphics or performant physics computation. You might also want to do that from C, C++, whatever, so from a low-level language, uh, which uh, gets out everything from, from your mobile phone. Of course, on the other hand, um, native code uh, is harder to write and also to debug, of course and it has to be ported to Android, which makes it a bit harder, of course. So um, let, let me uh, lose some words about the Tegel program we are doing at the German Aerospace Center. It's a, a central uh, geometry library and the viewer program used by many simulation tools uh, for aircraft design, actually, and for visualization. And what you can do is depicted here on the right side. So in the center you have the Tegel uh, program or the Tegel library. We have some parametric description of our aircraft which just describe the overall geometry actually and then the library itself creates a geometry and transfers the geometry of the aircraft to different tools, for example, to compute aerodynamics, to compute the infrared structure of the aircraft, to evaluate the structural behavior of the aircraft and the aeroelastics and the coupling between the aerodynamics and the structure. Or you can also use that in order to compute the radar signature. 
both your radar signature and infrared signature, you might want to use that more or for military aircraft, since this is important things there. Um, Teagle is written in C++. Uh, it's actually medium-sized code base, about 50,000 lines of code. But uh, importantly, we are using, we're not doing all the math by ourselves. We're using a, a open source uh, um, geometry kernel. It's called Open Cascade. It's about 4 million lines of code. And you don't want to rewrite that in Java, right? So this is why, why we want to do that here, why we port that. And for our Android part, we are using the 3D engine Open Scene Graph. I don't know if anyone heard about that. Um, so everything is actually multi-platform. It runs on Windows, Linux, on Mac, and now also after porting on Android 2, and it's open source. And here, just have a look at what the Teagle can do. So here, you have the viewer of, of the Teagle geometry library, and you can use that to create meshes of the geometry for uh, aerodynamic calculation, CFD. You can use exchange file formats to bring that into uh, CAD systems in order to model afterwards more. Or you can also export to Blender and do some rendering and visualization. Or when we did that last year here, you can also export it in order to make 3D prints of that. Also quite nice. And this is how the viewer looks like on different platforms, on Linux, Mac, Windows, and on Android. And I'd like to show you first um, the program on Windows, and I'm going to talk about uh, all the process, and I'm finally I'm showing you the same program on Android. So let's start the Teagle Viewer. It's here a Windows program since I'm using the Windows. And for example, let's uh, load an aircraft here. It, it was building up. I can close it again and reopen it. You can see how it's, it uses the CAD kernel in order to create the geometry. So you see step by step how all the parts are generated. You can select the different parts of the aircraft. You can compute uh, points on, on the wing, for example, like this. Um, another aircraft we just recently developed was this here. <laughs> just a joke, of course. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's the um, Teagle Viewer program. So now I'm going to talk about how you actually do this, uh, how you're going to port everything. This was just a small motivation here. So why did we do that for Android? Actually, we didn't have like any scientific reason. We are most uh, in the German Aerospace Center. We are using Linux systems and Windows systems. The only reason we had because we can do it, and it's fun, yeah. So let's talk about the hacking aspect. Um, what you'll need in order to start up with uh, native uh, development is you need the Android SDK, of course. My, my, that might be like a good point where you can just look into the, into the round here and just ask uh, who of you did already Android the app development, are there any? Okay, so some of them. And who of you is developing desktop app or just C++ code for the desktop? Anyone using C++? Okay, also some. And who of you have used C++ from within Android? Okay, two. So this is not an expert talk, uh, so you probably don't get any expert answers, but just more the introduction of that, okay? so. So the minority, as expected, uh, so two, two people here did that already. So you might know these steps uh, you have to go through. So at the next step, you have to download the native development kit from Google. And this includes um, the cross compilers um, that you can compile your C++ code to the, um, to for, for example, for ARM or for x86 or also for MIPS. So all these tool chains you can find in there. And it has um, the NDK build system, which is a standard um, build system in order to compile the code uh, for native, or in order to compile native code. It's from Google, it's based on make files. And you also have a debugger called NDK GDB to debug the native X, uh, code. And 
you also have some Android specific libraries in there in order to, for example, to talk to the logging mechanism of Android or in order to query the information of your sensors or whatever. So there are some extra libraries in there. And what you also might uh, want to download or use is CMake or AutoTools in order to cross compile all your dependencies you have. So you probably have dependencies to other libraries from your project, so you have to cross compile them. I'm also going to talk about that, how you can do that. So first, of course, you have to install the SDK and NDK if you didn't already do that, did that. Um, and then now that is the, I think the most complicated part actually, cross compile all your dependencies to Android. And also you might have to patch all your, or some of your dependencies if you are not completely platform independent. Um, then you have to write a Java interface class um, which you're using for the communication between the Java and the C, C++ world. So you need like an extra class for that. Then you have to write the glue code that combines both worlds, C and C, uh, Java. And so which calls the native code and translates Java objects and Java data types to C and also in the other direction, of course. And then you're creating shared library containing your native code. Then you're designing a user interface, uh, which talks then to your JNI wrapper you recently developed and so that you can talk to your C++. And finally, you have to build the app, compile everything, the native code and the standard build steps to build the rest, the Java. And I'm gonna talk about these steps here, of course, So, which is only NDK specific. Um, so first, um, using third party libraries um, or how to cr um, cross compile them is not really nice since um, it's quite involving and you don't get much out of that, but you have to do that, of course. Um, but first of all, let me mention, many uh, open source libraries are already ported for Android. So please first look for them. Um, um, use these if available. You can like, uh, else that's lots, lots of work to port that. So, and you can find many of them already on the Android GitHub page, uh, for example, um, like the standard libraries, libxml and whatever, they are already there. But if you still have to port a library, so if it doesn't exist for Android, so you have two options then. You can either cross compile um, the library using the default build system of the library, that could be AutoTools or CMake or whatever the library is using. And if you did that, you're creating also a or you have to package everything into a so-called pre-built module. I'm gonna talk about that, how to do that. The other option is, of course, you can still override the, um, the default build system of your library, write a new Android MK file, and build everything on your own. That's the other option. And this is what uh, the, the open source libraries are actually are doing. But that might be a bit too involving if you have a large library like Open Cascade, and you don't want to do that. So, as an example, I want to talk about, for example, how you can cross-compile using a CMake-based library or CMake-based uh, tool. So first of all, you have um, to install a so-called standalone compiler tool chain. Um, the Android, Android NDK comes uh, with a script. It's called Make Standalone Tool Chain. And you call that, you just define uh, which platform, Android platform you're targeting and where you want to install that, and you get a standalone toolchain. The standalone toolchain includes all the compilers, all the libraries, the include files, everything you need. It just installs it into one directory. Then you're creating a toolchain file, which I call here androidtoolchain.cmake, and here I'm just defining where I installed my toolchain, so what's the basis directory of that, and this is here really important, these, the both lines. Here we are setting up the C and C++ compiler. So after that, CMake knows that you're not compiling with your standard C system C compiler, but with the Android one. And these lines are also important in order that prevents us, or that prevents that CMake is mixing 
system libraries or system compilers with the Android ones. So just use that and you should be safe. And then um, when you configure a CMake project, just call CMake with this additional argument CMake toolchain file and add the Android, the just recently written file. And in that way, you should be able to translate a CMake-based third-party library to Android. Of course, you might still need some patching of the code. Um, if you have that, you're not done. So you have to package everything in a pre-built Android module, and this is an example here what you can do. So you have to write a, another android.mk file where you actually just define your library you, you just created and include path. So here I was just defining a module or a library PT kernel that's part of the open cascade, just as an example. And in the next part, local source file. It looks like a source file, but it isn't. It's already a compiled one, a compiled library here. Then I'm setting up the include directories. Since I want to use this library, I have to say, I have to state where my project is finding all the includes of this library. And the important part is here, uh, I have to imp include a pre-built static library script, which just makes in the background the rest. So I just add this thing to your install path of your recently created library, copy that there, and you're done. So you have created now a pre-built Android model by cross-compiling. The other way, of course, is to override the default build scripts and just write an own, and you, you have to write a custom Android MK file, and this is a really simplistic one for, for a library we are doing. It's called Tixi, and it's similar to a make file again. Here I'm defining what my library should be like, Tixi static here, where all my include paths are, and here I'm using wildcards, just adding all C, C files from the source directory, and these source files are compiled to a library. And here in that part, I also have to define, of course, my dependencies of this library. And it depends on libxslt, xml, and cur, so that in the end, my project knows what other libraries have to be linked here. And of course, for a large project, for a large library, this can be really, really large, this make file. So that might not be working as uh, just normal cross-compiling. So you have to decide what, what way you have to go. Um, just an example um, how we ported the, the, the monster, the Open Cascade monster, four million lines of code to Android. Um, it was not completely, uh, totally a platform independent. Um, you might know um, on Linux uh, you have the glibc library, right? That's the standard C library and it, it provides some standard structures, standard um, pr um, methods. And Android is not using the GNU standard library. Instead, they have written their own standard library. It's called Bionic C. And it's a bit different from uh, the GNU uh, C library. For example, it has no time zone function, and Open Cascade was using it. So we have to find a way around that. We just setting here like fixed time zone, but that might not be working in your case. Uh, also, the glibc has a password structure with the member pwg cos, which includes your username, and you don't find that on the Bionic C library. So again, you have to find a way around that. And it, Bionic C misses also standard system V inter process communication calls. Again, you have to find your way around that. For example, these, all these functions for semaphore uh, management and shared memory access you don't have there. Quite important is still that when, when you're changing your code for Android, you can use the if dev Android macro since the the, um, the NDK toolchain defines the underscore underscore Android underscore underscore macro, so it can always ask in the code, am I compiling that for Android or, or for Linux or for Windows or whatever? So use that so that you maintain the same code base uh, for 
all your platforms. You don't want to write a different uh, code for Android than for, for other code bases. Also, um, in Open Cascade itself, uh, it was using a lot of x11 commands uh, for the rendering, for example, and we had to deactivate everything uh, with respect to the rendering, and we had to complete, completely um, change rendering engine, and that's why we were using OpenSeeing Graph for that. So, as you can see, uh, this might be involving. There are other libraries which are quite simple to port, but this one was a bit more involving. So, um, that was the third party library stuff. Uh, I mean, you have to use that where you have to do that probably, but that's not particularly fun. Which is better is uh, than when you really start into the development. Um, and I'm gonna talk uh, now how to talk now to between both well, the Java code and the C, C++ code. And what enables you to do is, is the so-called Java native interface, JNI. Uh, so that enables the communication between the both worlds. And it's actually done, realized um, by you compile everything into a shared library. Uh, on Windows, that's a DLL. On Android or in Linux, that's a .so file. And Java just loads this library and calls functions from that library. So the JNI provides mechanisms to load this library using the system load library command. Um, it provides functions to convert between Java and C data types. And it has mechanism also for the other side that you can call Java methods from C. Sometimes you also have to do that. You have to uh, inform your, your user interface that something happened in your computation, for example. Uh, but um, what, what is not so nice is that you have to write the glue code, which is in between here, which are using the Java native interface by hand or by yourself. And that might be a bit tricky and uh, error prone. And that's why there is a tool Java H is called, which um, translates a Java class into a header file for a C. And you, I really emphasize to do that, and I'm gonna show you later on how to do that. So first you start uh, with a interface from Java, uh, which reflects somehow the library which you have on the other side, like on C. Um, let's, it's called native interface, and just for now, forget what this is, means. Uh, so here I have, I just defined um, three methods, um, which should be initialization method for my C library, and then just a method which retrieves a string, I called that get name, and here a method, really simplistic, which sets a string. The important uh, message here is that all these uh, methods, since you don't have a implementation for that, you have to call or state them as native. Then Java knows, okay, the code for that execution should be inside a shared library. That's in, in the C world. And in order that you can call these things, you have to load the shared library, which you were creating. And this is the block what is doing here. So when, when using this class as a, in the first, uh, the first time, um, it loads the library, and here I just called it tutorial native. So that's really important. If you don't do that, your app will probably crash. So in the next step, you're using the Java H command onto that class, and this will generate a header file. I will show you later on this works. And the header file looks about like that. Um, it's automatically created. It, the function names are quite nasty, really long. So you have the Java prefix, then you have here um, the package name, then you have the class name, and finally a method name. And it's quite error prone because of these long strings and also um, the signature of your functions. So what particular arguments you have and which, which way you're calling that. So it's, it's a bit tricky, that's why you should really use the tool Java H to generate that. And then, if you have that, then you can start implementing all these things here. And just an example, I don't go into detail, uh, detail what I did here, but here I created a, 
uh, extra C++ code file and did the implementation. And, and now um, I'm showing you how to do that here in detail. So I just prepared uh, an Eclipse project. Um, and that, that's the user interface uh, for, for my tutorial I'm going to show you. It has three buttons, and each button should trigger a C function, right? And just for demonstration purposes, the first one should calculate a Fibonacci number. Here we just enter an integer, so we want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, and we should get a result. And these both buttons are for setting and getting a string. Here we just enter a string, we just press set the string, and when we press get the string, then it should be displayed there. So quite simplistic, not particularly beautiful, but it should uh, demonstrate what I'm going to do now. So let's have a look here uh, into the project. Uh, what you can see is um, there is a JNI folder that includes uh, your native code, that includes a C code. And let's have a look. Uh, I already implemented or did some C implementation uh, for all these three functions. Uh, here's the interface, the header file, just Fibonacci number, get name and set name, as in the uh, as in the Java word. And here is the actual implementation. Quite easy. Here we have a global variable storing some string. I just stored default name there. Uh, next, I have the Fibonacci computation in a recursive fashion. Not particularly uh, fast, but still just for demonstration purposes. Here, a function that returns the string uh, we stored in a global variable, and here, a function that changes the string. Okay? So now we want to um, yeah, tr do the translation. Um, so this time we have to call um, our tool, Java H, I already mentioned, in order to create a glue code. And let's do that. So I prepared a batch file. So now we are in here in the directory, and you can see, okay, here's my uh, library and and an Android MK file and so on. And now let's invoke the Java H tool. Java H. I have to define the class path uh, where so the the path where I can find all the compiled classes. It's don't I have already a bin directory here? Not yet. Just press play. Okay, now I should have a bin directory. So bin classes. Um, and now I have to uh, enter the name of my uh, I, of my um, interface class here for Scon native. So we have to add the, um, the package name de.dlr.frostconTutorial. Dot and now the class name Frostcon Native. Uh, native. So that worked. And now we should have a new file. It's here generated de.dlr and so on the header file. So let's have a look in, in the header file here. It's in, inside the JNI folder. Just refresh. Just refresh. There we are. So this is the automatically created uh, file from from our class. And now we are have to implement everything. So in the next step, we have to create the according um, C file or C plus plus files, a new um, source file. CPP. Now we have to include uh, this header file. And of course, we also have to include the header file of our library we want to wrap. So now I'll just use some Eclipse magic. We are just implementing everything automatically, more or less. So now we have, have it here already, the function bodies. So just let me put 
my library header file on the side. Uh, why it's not working? Ah. Like this. So, okay, first let's implement the Fibonacci cal calculation. That's quite easy. Um, this function accepts an integer and just returns an integer. And as you can see, this uh, function body has already an integer, um, a j int uh, um, argument. So you can just use that. You don't have to convert it particularly. j int is the same as integer. So we are just uh, calling our library um, Fibonacci, passing the argument n, and we're done. So that was quite easy, actually. The next function is a bit more involving since the get name returns a C++ string, and we have to convert the C++ string into a Java string and return that. And fortunately, uh, the JNI has functions for that, and we are using the so-called JNI environment uh, uh, object for this. So first, we are just retrieving the string, std string. name equals my lib from our library. So that was the easy part. Now we have to convert it. So um, as I already mentioned, there is the JNI environment object, and we're using that. It has lots of uh, methods for converting data types. And we are in particular uh, using the new string UTF function, and we're just passing a pointer to a character array, like that, and we're done. So that was not so hard, but uh, you have to remember all the names and you have to know how to do that. So finally, um, the set name uh, function is the other direction. So we get a Java string here when we look into there. This function body has a Java string. Um, argument, we have to convert it into a C string and pass it to our library. So let's do that. First, just define some names here, jack string and the environment. And first of all, we have to convert the Java string to a C string. So to a character array, C string equals, and we again using the environment uh, object and using this time um, the function um, uh, um, was it what was it called again? Get get string UTF characters. This is the function to convert Java strings to uh, C strings, and you pass the Java string object, and you can add just a null pointer for that. So. Now we have, now that function created us a character array here, so that involved also some allocation of memory. And in the end, we have to free it again in order to prevent memory leaks. We have to keep it in mind. So now we can pass that to our library, set name, C string. That was the easy part. Now we have to free it, as I already said, else we won't, will have a memory leak. So let's do that. Again, we are using the environment for that. And it has a release uh, string UTF characters. It's the first argument we pass in the Java string, and the second, the C string. And we should be fine. So that was more or less the hard part. Now we, we have written the glue layer between the Java and the C. And let's have a look if we can compile everything. So now you can see uh, here the compilation worked. And you can also see that it did compile everything for two architectures. Here, the compilation of the MyLib and the DEFROSCON CPP was compiled for the ARM architecture and in another round for x86. And this is important to know. You have to add in your application MKFA all the architectures you want to support. If you want to support also MIPS, you have to add it there. Else, it won't run on the MIPS platform. It would just crash. Okay, 
So that worked just now. Um, I have the emulator here. We can try it out, right? So um, just press play. And it should start in the emulator. There we are. So that's the app. Um, let's try the Fibonacci computation. Just enter a number here, compute. That looks good. You can just try smaller uh, values in order to check if this is right and looks correct. So the Fibonacci computation works, of course. Um, just try out the other things. If we are using the get name function, it should retrieve the global variable from the string. Just have a look what it looked like. Here in the mylibcpp, I was defining the string at the beginning with default name. Just have a look if that works. Okay, we're getting the default name as an answer. That looks good. And now we can uh, write something else in there. Hi, Frost, hi, all at Frostcon. Set the name. Now pressing get name again. Okay, that worked. That's really nice. So this actually was more or less um, everything you have to know if you have a really basic API between the both worlds. So if you just stick to simple um, or basic data types. So let's continue. Um, now I'd like to talk about the life cycle of native code since it's a bit different than the um, Java life cycle. So all of you who already wrote um, Android apps, you might know about the life cycle. It's a bit complex. You have several states of an app. An app can be in several states. You have the running state. You have a state which is paused. You have a state stopped uh, and starting and so on. And for all these changes between states, there are methods in the um, activity API where you can react on these state changes. And what was normally done is that, for example, in on pause, the state will be stored. So when you later on go into the uh, app again, uh, the state will be um, restored so that everything looks the same as when, when you were leaving the app. But you have to do it manually. Uh, it's, it can be quite involving to do that everything. Um, in contrast, um, when, you were, when you're exiting, for example, a, um, such a hybrid app, the library which you were creating that remains in memory, that means no state is changing. So, uh, the library remains at its same state. That means, of course, if you're exiting the app, it resides in memory and it might be a memory leak for your overall system of it if you have a huge app. So you might want to uh, clean your library before leaving. So you have to manage everything by your own. You have to write all the state changes uh, functions and call them from your Java code. And if you don't do that, uh, you can also um, use that as a feature, of course, since you're closing your app, go into, and you have the same state as before. Um, I also want to show you what I really mean with that. Just uh, go back to the emulator um, here. So now just have a look at what, what, what's standing there. So you have hi all at Frostcon string there. You have the five as a number entered. And you have, again, hi all at Frostcon at the bottom. Um, so when we are leaving now our app and go back into the app, all the Java part should reinitialize. I don't know what's now here. Search has stopped, and that's demonstration effect. OK, just go back into the program. So that's as, uh, as I, uh, that's the main initialization. So everything is back at, at the reset it actually. But if we are pressing now get name, not the default name should be there. Instead, hi, all Frostcon, what I already entered before. So the library knows everything. It, it maintains at the last state. And in order to reset it, we have to kill, actually, the app and start it again. Let's try this. Um, so killing the app. 
And now if you start uh, the program and it looks at first uh, the same, but now if I'm pressing the get name, it's default name. So this is actually the difference and you have to keep the things in mind in order to manage that, yeah? It's suspended. Yeah, it's, it's suspended. It's um, yeah, it's suspended like uh, on other operating systems. Um, but of course, uh, it, it it keeps the memory, all the memory which it needs. Uh, it you you lose this from from your all over around. So yeah. So. Um, if you have an involving app doing lots of computation and you go back out, you go back uh, into the main thing, it won't consume any CPU power. Okay. So, but it's it's really different um, from from the normal life cycle. So uh, that was it about life cycle. Now I'm going to talk about uh, packaging. Let's have a look onto the watch. 41. Um, so this is how to um, actually uh, integrate the NDK into the Gradle build system. I don't know if you have heard about Gradle. It's a new build system for Android and it replaces Apache and or Maven and it's now used by the new Android Studio. So there's a good reason that you actually should use Gradle, but you have to integrate all the NDK build steps into that. Um, Actually, um, Google uh, recently added the NDK integration into Gradle, but it's quite buggy, at least when I tried that. For example, it creates uh, the Android MK make files automatically, but they don't work. So you have to provide workarounds for that. Um, so first you have to disable the automatic creation and write your own Android MK make files for your, for your native JNI code. And then you have to define a custom build task inside Gradle, which itself calls the NDK build command. And this is what it looks like. So um, first, you have to register the libs directory, which, which was created, um, so that it, it's be packed, in, packed into the APK and disable the automatic creation of the Android MK file. Both lines are doing that. The first is registering the libs, and the second is disabling the automatic creation. Then this is how you can define a custom build task. Uh, so I just called it NDK build. And here I'm doing a, just asking if my system I'm, I'm compiling here is Windows or Linux. And when, when it's Windows, I'm using the command NDK build dot command. And in the other case, just the plain NDK build. And here in the last line, this defines the command line of this tool. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding the minus J option in order to activate parallel um, parallel um, compilation, which makes in several cases much faster. And it just asks for the available processors here. So this is quite nice. And finally, you have to add this new created task to your build dependency. So you just add it to the compile task. So that's basically it. Then you can uh, use Gradle and everything works or should work actually. So let's come to running and testing. Um, so when you are using, when you're writing compute intensive algorithms or apps, um, you will notice um, that the normal Android emulator is too slow since it emulates ARM instructions. All the ARM instructions has to be translated to x86 and that tip tends to be uh, really, really slow, and you probably don't want to have that. So what you can do instead is that you're switching to an x86-based emulator uh, with GPU acceleration. Google provides um, this kind of emulator with the uh, SDK, but it's not the standard emulator, so you have to download a x86-based um, Android um, image and install that to the emulator and so on. What you can also do is uh, you install the Intel HAXM acceleration driver, which or, um, still provides a further boost of, of the emulation. And this is also part of the Android SDK, so I would recommend to do that. And then now again, the hard part is you have to recompile everything to x86 again, not only to ARM, but also to x86. Um, 
with another NDK toolchain. And you have to add the x86 uh, target to the app ABI inside the application MK file in order to activate compilation. So you have to prepare everything, but then you can use that. Um, and when you use that, this is what you get then finally, and this is now the time I can show you the app on Android now uh, from within the emulator maybe. So here, this is an x86 based emulator. It still is a bit slow sometimes, but the apps are working really good. So here you see uh, the Tegel viewer on Android, just switch the direction here. And let's open some aircraft. Now we are opening the same what we had before. So this is now how it looks like. And you have like um, SP4, a 3D um, rendering. It's kind of fluent, so it works quite well. Um, you have everything actually what you also have on uh, on the desktop. And that, that's quite nice. We can delete things here. The app, of course, is a bit more simplistic uh, than the app on the desktop, but it works as expected. Uh, it also, um, of course, uh, does uh, all the touch event handling. I have it here also on that here for ARM, and you don't, I don't know if you see anything, but touch, uh, it's like zoom, zoom to pinch and everything, it works, uh, yeah, as expected. So, I really emphasize for using an x86, else all the rendering would be painfully slow. You actually couldn't use that. So um, then you might uh, have seen that I'm not using the standard uh, Android emulator, but the emulator is called Genymotion. It's really fast. It's also faster than a standard Android emulator. And uh, it's using, it's also x86 based and using VirtualBox under the hood. I don't know, you probably know VirtualBox. And um, it, you can download uh, many pre-configured devices. For example, I for myself have three devices in the emulator, Google Nexus 7 and 10 and HTC One. So you can just switch between them. It's, it's really comf comfortable and I really recommend using this one. So finally, uh, as my Actually, last slide, I'm gonna talk about how to debug everything uh, in Eclipse and with the NDK GDB, since that can be quite tricky. Um, first, you have to define, uh, inside your application MK file, you have to define as a debug build, that you have all the debug informations in that, of course. And then, um, in the next step, you has also have to add the ndk underscore debug option to the ndk build command. This is really important since this adds some extra files uh, to your APK. Without these files, debugging won't work. And then there is a, a bug in Eclipse uh, which actually prevents debugging or which so that debugging doesn't work. So you have to run once uh, for, for the project also the ndk gdb command from the command line. So let's try this. Um, as, a, as a final note, um, in the Genimation emulator, the debugging only works with the patch, so you have to install a patch into the emulator, else it won't work. So let's have a look. So if we have a look here into the libs directory, there are, for you now for each platform, um, the shared library we were creating, and now we have to change the build. We have to add to the build command uh, the ndk debug equals one option. So apply that. Now we are rebuilding everything, and now you see uh, that there were created uh, two different uh, files, gdb server and gdb setup, which are necessary, and else you won't uh, be able to do that. And as I already mentioned, you have to call once the G NDK GDB command, else debugging won't work. So first we have to start the app here on, on the emulator. Or first we have to install it actually. Just run it. So now there we are. And while it's running, we have to call the NDK GDB uh, command 
gdp.py mean minus minus no weight. So that connects now to the app. Okay, that was actually already it. Uh, now we can use that from Eclipse. So just now we can debug it as a C++ app. What is really important here is uh, that uh, in your debug configuration you add that as, as an Android native application, uh, else you won't be able to debug that. So it asks us now to switch the perspective. Um, here in the background the app's already started. And now just try to set some breakpoint. Let's set it here in the Fibonacci computation, for example. And yeah, we, now we can try it. So we enter some number. And now in the background, the breakpoint was reached and we can also see the value. We can also change it here, um, modify the variables. Uh, three, just run, resume everything. So, and now we get the result. It's three, of course, since I changed the variable. So this way you can debug it. And you have to really stick to the instructions I gave, else it's really hard. And it was really hard to find out for myself all these steps. I really struggled like two days or whatever in order to fix all these things and find out the bugs and workarounds for that. So that is really helpful here. So just come. How long did you experiment with this? With the debugging? Yes. Like about two days I already mentioned, yeah. Since uh, it was. Uh, recently or some time ago? Like some month ago, yeah. Yeah. Um, you ask uh, about Android Studio, um, if it's working there, I didn't try that out, so uh, it probably will work there and probably will also work better. But on the other hand, um, the NDK integration in Android Studio is quite immature, so if you do NDK uh, developing, de development, I would stick to Eclipse for now. Um, yeah. 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 So isn't that a quite big app then for the user? Good question. So I'm repeating it. You were just asking um, how if you're just uh, adding all the native libraries for different art architectures in one app, um, if that might increase the APK size. And that's true, actually. One library here is about 12 megabytes for the, since we're using the large open cascade. And so if you're, uh, we, we support uh, three different architectures, so you would end up with 36 megabytes an app. And that's probably too large for users to download or depends on. But what you can do is you can compile or you can create three different APKs and upload them into the uh, App Store. Um, and you will only get the right APK. So there, there's an instruction of Google in a web where you can just read that. And so we did that. So we. Each APK is about 12 megabytes, and you just get the right APK for your target. So that's a nice thing there. And so here, it's in the store. You can download it. It's not only for aircraft geometries, but you can also um, look at standard uh, CAD exchange file formats like STEP or IDES or whatever. So just feel free to try it out. It comes with some um, example files already, so you can try that. So uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, the project, uh, the demonstration project is all on GitHub. Just uh, try it uh, if you want. Uh, if you feel free also to experiment with that and write me some questions about it. Yeah. Um, I have never experienced problems with that, so sorry, uh, I can answer to that. Other questions? Okay, uh, there are no questions anymore. Then thank you for attending my talk. Um, yeah, 
have fun here. And ah, yeah, we are with the German Aerospace Center. We have a booth here. Uh, just when you go out, um, would be nice if you come by. If you have any questions, or we also have a, a kicker a match there. If you want to play kicker, just come by, and yeah, you will be glad. Thanks. <laughs>